a solitary lion crosses one of Africa's most beautiful national parks. The Ngorongoro crater of Tanzania shelters some of the most spectacular natural wonders on Earth. Over two and a half million years ago, a great volcanic cone erupted. When the dust finally settled, all that remained was a giant bowl 12 miles across, surrounded by a rim rising 2,000 feet above the crater floor. During the wet season, abundant rainwater flows down the walls of the crater to form Lake Makat, where flamingos return to feed by the thousands. The water absorbed in the crater during the wet season provides an ample supply of grass, which for most of the year supports a population of up to 25,000 large animals, including herds of wildebeest, water buffalo, elephant, rhinoceros, hippopotamus, and eland. lions live in family groups or prides of eight or more spread evenly across the crater. From records kept over the past 20 to 30 years, it is known that the number of lions in the crater has remained about the same. The gestation period of the female lion is about 110 days. There is no special birth season and cubs can be born throughout the year. Like most cats, lions usually sleep or rest during the day for up to 21 hours. They will even rest between periods of feasting on a kill. Some will climb into trees to sleep draped over the branches to avoid insects that swarm over them on the ground. Others, gorged with meat from a kill, will roll from side to side, seeking a comfortable position for the large meal bulging in their stomachs. The pride is a complex social structure consisting of from two to 20 or more females and their cubs. The females are related to each other and usually remain together throughout their lives as they do most of the hunting. After a meal, the pride gathers, grooming and touching each other and strengthening their family bonds. During rest periods, the cubs stay close to their mothers or other females. Here in the Ngorongoro crater, water is plentiful most of the year. The lions usually drink once a day, in the early morning or after a kill. Male lions are not permanent members of the pride, which may have from one to four adult males. These may stay in the pride for as long as six years, but more often lead a nomadic life traveling alone or in small groups throughout the crater. When hunting, the pride will either band in small groups or roam alone in search of prey.
At times, a female with newborn cubs will seek solitary shelter away from the males. No one is certain if she chooses to leave or is forced away from the close social structure of the pride. Lions have few distinctive markings to assist in recognizing other members of the pride, especially over long distances. Therefore, they must approach another pride member in a direct manner, without hesitation. Should an approaching lion of the pride seem unsure of itself, it may be attacked as if it were a stranger. If a lioness is attacked several times, she may become unsure of herself and eventually leave her pride. In this way, the pride remains relatively stable in size. Like most young cats, lion cubs spend a great deal of time playing. Their games of attack prepare them for the lifelong search for food. These two, a male and a female, are about a year old. The females are less temperamental than the males and show little reaction to mistaken identity. So most females remain with the pride, while the young males are eventually forced to leave. By the time they are two and a half to three and a half years old, young males are forced out by the mature males who take over the pride for mating. And so the pride receives an infusion of new blood from the mature males who fight for mating privileges. But in time, these males will be driven off by the younger breeding lions. Due to increased tourism, the lions have become accustomed to vehicles and to humans filming and observing their behavior. The camera crew has left the camera running while the young lions inspect the tires. They are distracted by a shout from the cameraman who is more in fear for the safety of the tires than for his companions. Koi! Go on. Don't! return to their mother for comfort and grooming. In a few years, the male yearling may be driven from the pride by an older male seeking to stake a claim. The young male will then spend a few years wandering alone or with other young males. As summer wears on, the great herds of wildebeest range over the crater floor. Grazing in the shimmering heat of the sun, the great herds are one of the main prey of the crater lions. The zebra are safer on the barren plain, but as they move into the taller grass, they are now at risk by the stalking female lions. The mottled brown coat of the lioness blends perfectly with the tall grass, now parched and brown in the summer sun. Hardly moving, the great cat waits for the unwary zebra to move closer to its place of concealment. It is not unusual for only one lion to hunt a zebra. Even though she may have greater success in numbers, once the lioness reaches her prey, the zebra will have little chance of survival. She stalks downwind of the zebra, slowly working her way closer and closer. Now joined by another lioness, she continues to wait for the zebras to move closer. do not have the speed or stamina of other great cats, like the cheetah, and must wait patiently while their prey moves closer, and then, with a short sprint, attempt a quick kill. Now less than 50 feet from the zebra, the lioness waits. She is barely visible to the unsuspecting herd. She begins to close in, hunched low in the tall grass.
Venus pins the zebra to the ground, the rest of the pride begins to devour the still living zebra. Still breathing, the zebra dies in what must be terrible agony as the great beasts gorge. Their stomachs filled, the lions clean each other by licking the still fresh blood from each other's muzzles and coats. After the kill, the lioness joins her cubs and begins a long rest period to digest her meal. Some miles away, a second pride is preparing to hunt. Lions, like most carnivorous animals, live within a well-defended territory. This territory must contain a source of water and plentiful food and can encompass from 10 to 100 square miles. In the heart of the territory, the lioness is able to bear her cubs, protected by the other members of the pride. On this day, a water buffalo has been killed near an access road in the crater. Unconcerned by passing tourists' vehicles, the pride runs to the fresh kill. The pride's territory is carefully guarded by the dominant males. Roaring to alert trespassers, the male rushes forward, bellowing his rage to deter nomadic lions from entering his territory. Now safe from outsiders, the pride is on the move, possibly searching for more game or a protected water source. This pride has a large concentration of cubs and yearlings. Stretched out along the access road, they seem indifferent to time or distance as they slowly make their way following the others. stretches out in the high grass and rests throughout most of the day. It is difficult to determine why they have decided to move from one part of their territory to another. Even at rest, the females keep close watch over the young cubs. Lions have a well-defined system of communication. Using body contact, facial movement, and sounds, a lion expresses itself clearly to other members of the pride and to strangers who may try to enter its territory. As spring turns to summer, a flock of crowned cranes flies over a herd of zebra feeding on the open savanna. In the marsh, 
chicks of the blacksmith plover search for small bugs and then seek shelter in the feathers of their parent. Emerging from her hiding place, a female and three very small cubs set out to join the pride. For the young cubs, it is a long trip across the open plain. Camouflaged by the long grass, the female usually remains in hiding until her cubs are old enough to walk. Lion cubs are almost helpless when born. Weighing from two to five pounds at birth, they can barely crawl and do not open their eyes before one or two weeks. Newborn cubs have a slightly spotted coat, which helps to hide them in the thick grass. This color changes after three to five months. Sensing that the smallest and weakest cub is falling behind, the lioness gently carries it by the neck across a dry mud bank, while the other two cubs scurry to keep up. Slowly making her way past the others, she selects her spot. Here she rests while the cubs nurse. When several lionesses give birth at the same time, they frequently share the duties of raising all the cubs. This communal area then becomes the general meeting place for the entire pride. Communal gatherings allow all members of the pride to become acquainted with the cubs. over the crater rim, a herd of elephants spray dust across their backs to discourage biting insects. Along the edge of Lake Makat, a flock of migrating birds pause to feed. Among the trees, a small herd of zebra and an old elephant with only one tusk feed peacefully in the clear morning air. Near the lake shore, gazelles graze contentedly as they share their pasture with a flock of ducks. Knee deep in the mud of the swamp, a huge water buffalo wallows contentedly. The buffalo is the lion's largest and most formidable prey and is capable of putting a marauding lion to flight. Lions are usually wary of an adult buffalo, which can severely injure or kill an adult lion with its sharp horns. During the heat of the day, the pride rests in the soft, high grass. The lion leads a life without threat, for their only real enemy, the hyena, will not attack the entire pride. If caught alone on the plain, an adult lion and cubs, or even young adults, can be at great risk from a pack of hyena. In the afternoon, the yearlings spar with one another, or their mother, who usually gives them a quick swat for their trouble. Then, relaxed and seemingly full of affection for the cubs, the female joins in the afternoon play.
A young male and female of the pride also share in mock combat, which helps them sharpen their skills for real attacks as hunting adults. Late in the afternoon, the pride begins its quest for prey. Separated from a small herd of zebra by the mud flats of a slowly drying lake, two females are forced to leap a small stream. Now the yearling male must also cross. He seems in a quandary whether he should jump as the adult females have done or swim. Most cats are excellent swimmers, but they will avoid the water unless it is absolutely necessary. spreads out across the plain, making its way to a herd of zebra over a mile away. Screened by the high grass, the lions stealthily approach the zebra. With the wind blowing from the zebra toward the lions, the zebra are unaware of the approaching danger. Lions are known to approach their prey from either upwind or downwind. Time seems to stand still as the zebra slowly pass before one and then another of the crouching hunters. crossing this area to graze near a large herd of wildebeest. Now, one lioness begins to move toward the zebra. Nearby, the entire pride is waiting for the moment to charge. Both wildebeest and zebra now seem to sense the presence of danger and barely move, uncertain from which direction an attack may come. As if spectators at a sporting match, the herd watches as the lion attacks. zebra and wildebeest and are only about 30% successful even when hunting in a group. After resting, the pride prepares for another attempt. The dominant female heads off in the direction of a large herd of buffalo. Extremely dangerous, the African water buffalo can weigh as much as a ton. The males gather around the periphery of the herd and the females and calves stay closer to the center. Seldom do one or two lions attempt an attack on a small herd of buffalo, or even on a single member that is feeding alone. But on occasion, whether they are truly hungry or just young lions practicing their hunting skills, such an encounter happens. It is seldom rewarding for the lions. Suspicious, short-tempered, and cunning, the buffalo is a formidable adversary and are extremely aggressive when confronted by a lion. In such short grass, the lions come as close as they can. Then they attack. Buffalo are quickly outrun by the lions. The 
It's not a fair match, two lions and three buffalo. The lions quickly break off when the buffalo turn to confront them. Closer to the lake, a larger herd is peacefully grazing. Here the grass is higher, which affords the lion better protection from being seen. Working as a team, the pride takes up position along the edge of the buffalo herd and move in. Surprised, the herd bolts, then just as quickly, whirl around to face their attackers and counterattack. The buffalo chase after the lions, who are now fleeing for their lives. Convinced that the danger is over, the buffalo move back to the marshy ground at lakeside. The lions, too, return to a less dangerous task. The lioness and her two yearlings, who have taken up sanctuary in a tree, also rejoin the pride. hungry and on the prowl, move, cubs and all, to a better location for hunting within their territory. The dry season is well advanced, and the lake has lost nearly all of its water. Crossing the dry lake, the female carries one of her cubs, while two others try to keep up. Somehow the pride passes too close to a herd of buffalo who try to trample the lions. In a valiant effort to protect the cubs, the lioness dashes at the buffalo and then runs back to her cubs, trying desperately to guide them to safety. Over and over she rushes at the great beasts, but the buffalo will not scatter and continue to charge the lioness and other members of the pride. Dawn finds the savanna calm with no signs of raging buffalo. The pride has sought the shelter of a secluded spot. The only animal now in view is the lioness as she searches for her cubs. Time after time she calls, but the cubs have disappeared, trampled by the buffalo herd. Prowl again, the pride spots a lone buffalo feeding in the high grass along the edge of a swamp. Separated from its herd, a single buffalo is still extremely dangerous and must be approached with caution. This large male, with its ear torn from either previous attacks or thorn bushes, 
is joined by a wattled starling who makes a meal from the ticks that infests the hide of the bull. Deciding to attack, the pride begins to stalk the bull. from the combined weight of the two lions, the bull stumbles. The other lions leap on him, robbing the bull of its strength. A yearling bravely joins the fight and attacks the bull's head. approach to drive the lions away, but the lions are not easily dissuaded. seeks refuge in the swamp, but the lions hold their position at the edge of the herd.
buffalo and head toward shore for a long rest. Great clouds begin to build over the crater as the dry season gives way to the wet. Lying at three degrees south, just below the equator, the Ngorongoro has only two seasons, wet and dry. November is the beginning of the wet, and as the rains fall, the season of renewal begins. Now the entire crater ecosystem absorbs the life-giving moisture and the parched ground bursts into life. For all of the animals of the crater, it is a time of patient waiting until the rains stop. Wildebeest, Grant's gazelle, lion, all soak in the cool rain. Within a week, the crater will turn green and a carpet of yellow flowers will cover the savanna. With the gray dust of the dry season finally settled by the rain, the crater puts forth the sweet, earthy smell of a new spring. The sun bursts forth to disclose the broad green carpet of the crater floor. Now the lake will fill, frogs emerge from the mud, and millions of insects issue forth as a banquet for the thousands of birds that quickly return to this extraordinary valley. African spoonbill preen each other's feathers as a black-winged stilt probes the shallows for tiny aquatic organisms. Each day, rain falls on the crater and the grass. The primary energy source for all animals grows more lush. Tissue paper flowers poke up through the thickening grass, and the herds of wildebeest and zebra graze across the crater floor. A few hours old, the young wildebeest are on their feet and able to run with the herd. Theirs is a cruel world, where speed and agility is the only defense against the lion, hyena, and cheetah. With their umbilical cords still hanging from their stomachs, the young wildebeest cavort, while another newborn, less than an hour old, stays close to its mother's side. Close by, a female and calf share a small stream with a flock of sacred ibis. The female is ever cautious of marauding carnivores. Near the service road that crosses the crater, a female lion with three cubs has emerged from hiding and is slowly moving to rejoin the pride. Young cubs like these have bluish-gray eyes for the first few weeks after birth. Then their eyes turn an amber color. Between the periods of rain, the pride sleeps in the midday sun. Although cooler than the dry season, here at the equator, the days are warm and pleasant. With plentiful game, the lions are well fed and peaceful. Hidden from view of the pride, a young male has been in hiding for over a week, nursing injuries received during a hunt. Now it emerges, its hind leg obviously swollen with a festering wound. Slowly, it approaches its mother, the lion which has just had the three cubs. Although she recognizes him, she is fearful and backs away, not quite sure what is wrong. Lions are very cautious of unusual behavior among the members of the pride, and usually will drive a sick or wounded member away. Another lioness rebuffs the injured male with a cuff of its paw, and then snaps with bared fangs. Then the entire pride moves its location, leaving the young male to fend for itself. it can hardly care for its wound. The male is no longer able to live with the pride. At nightfall, the pride will leave the area, and the young injured male will be left defenseless against a hyena attack.
millions of years, the cycle of life has played out in the Ngorongoro crater. From its western rim, the land stretches out toward the Olduvai Gorge, where Lewis and Mary Leakey found the remains of some of man's oldest ancestors. Farther on, at Laetoli, Mary Leakey found footprints that were left in damp volcanic ash some 3,700,000 years ago by two-legged, upright-walking primates, or hominids, possibly one of mankind's earliest ancestors. Looking at these prehistoric footprints, one can see where the two creatures, one possibly male and the other a female carrying a baby, had stopped and turned, as if sharing a moment of doubt. Man has shared the planet with animals for only a very short time. Early ancestors of the great cats and other animals of the crater lived in Africa for many millions of years before the emergence of any form of pre-human. Yet in the last 100 years, man has so altered the environment that thousands of species of animals, birds, fish, reptiles, and plants are extinct. Today, the nations of Africa share a common dilemma. The need for more farmland has reduced the once great herds of wild animals that roam the continent. However, since the end of World War II, much has been done to establish national parks in order to save the remaining unique species in Africa. This is the legacy of the Ngorongoro Conservation Area. Controlled in part by the crater's 2,000-foot-high rim, most animals are still free to migrate in and out of the crater. A young female slowly climbs up the rim to seek another pride outside on the Serengeti Plain. No one will know why she was forced to leave. But the life of the crater lions will pass on from one century to another, as long as modern man is aware of their fragile existence and is willing to exercise care. The infinite beauty and variety of the natural world is mankind's greatest treasure. All must exercise great care to preserve the environment and all of nature's creatures. Symbol of strength and majesty since the beginning of recorded history, the lion has always commanded man's respect. For centuries, it was considered an act of courage to kill a lion, and only recently have certain tribes given up the practice of a young man killing a lion as his rite of passage into manhood. Still free to roam the Ngorongoro crater, the lions are protected by the government. Located in the Arusha region of northern Tanzania, southeast of Serengeti, the Ngorongoro crater and its wildlife are one of the world's most beautiful sites and must be preserved. Coming up next on the Discovery Channel, cunning and deadly rattlesnakes search for unsuspecting... Thank you. 
Bible says that we're not to try to do things to get glory by our own works or by any preaching that we're going to do to get glory for ourselves. We we don't want to live that way. We want to live for God. How many Gentiles do you think are going to be reading this letter and thinking, I can't live like that? How many times do you think Christian groups are going to have converts to this letter? How many times do you think that even among atheists out there, you're going to say, you know what, I'm not living this way. I see other things going on. Who am I to judge? What am I to judge that makes me think that I'm going that way? We live in this mess because of this guy. We live in this mess for our own sake. You see, this letter is written in summary form to say, there are things that are happening in the Bible that we can't understand now in the Bible perfectly. And there are another way. We have done our best to be clear. In the Old Testament, in Leviticus, the law came by Torah and the prophets first, and later in the Sermon on the Mount. And in this letter, in Romans, Paul speaks at length and says, the Jews messed their religion. The men messed their religion. And that men have gone on to mess their religion for centuries. And so they need to ask for another mess. And so Paul is giving to the Corinthians, those who are already in the New Testament, like these Christians, who are rejecting the message of God's grace to them. It's not just for those who were first, but there are three other parts to the equation. See, the Corinthians weren't just taking all that money and trying to fix the things that God had for them. But not only are they all mothers, and they're for different reasons, but they believe that God only needs them to be secure. And they're opening up to the fact that in which God created the cross and Jesus, male and female, that was the original creation. Before the fall, before sin entered the world, that was the way that the human race was supposed to live. And so the point of this is, if someone is there, either a sexual orientation at the time of the fall, the time of sin and fallen and broken, that is not the way that the human race should live. And while Adam and Eve felt very insecure, this is not in and of itself a sin. The point of this is that we have to look at our sin. Because the Bible is clear that no sin, there is none that is sin. Only the most passionate sin that is sin. But sin is still there. They were wrongly tempted and then they sinned and fell. And then Paul, who is only the most beloved of God's people, who can now identify with him, pick up where he left off and begin to follow it up. And though it may not seem fair to us, God shows us how to live our lives. It is not our work to act out. But he has already done it. We can live shameless to those who hold a higher calling. And that is that they must accept Christ as their Messiah. We can either do that or kind of play it by ear and act like we're Christian. So that so people fall in love with what men do and fall to sin. And so people get cast out of God's kingdom. But everyone who has the Holy Ghost is Christian. We just have to make sure that we act that way. So people are also Christian who do not wear special clothing and have to put an ear on. It's good on them. And it's not even meant to be that they don't have to. What special way do we live to be Christian? We live to act in a way that makes God look better. And that's not how the Bible asks us to be Christian. It is because we have a special relationship with God that we're able to fall in love with him. Build a bond with him. A committed relationship with him. And keep on keeping on. And that is what God has called us to as well. And he says that we must be fearless and not be afraid. And that is true. And that is true for those who have set their eyes on Jesus. And that is what special relationship means to be Christian. So people can be Christian and be afraid and say no to God and say, I can't live this way. The emotional bond that builds in a person is there. It's already in their heart. And at some point, that is broken. So people can have a false sense of how to be Christian. And they too have to make sure that they act that way. The passage that Paul gives us today is very much like that. He's got that so people are called to a holy calling. Have the relationship with God and how to be Christian. So people are called to be afraid but not be afraid. To be fearless. So people can fall and just not have to be good people. Because we do, through scripture, that we are called.
Thank you. 